my uh, life growing up was, uh, you know, kind of one of those things where, you know, being a football player and, and uh, having the dad that I had and always being around, you know, some really good men growing up, uh, you know, had coaches and different men I worked for, that it kind of became part of me as I went into adulthood that I wanted to spend my life working with young people, especially boys. So I coached football for 14 years when I got out of college. And uh, in coaching, you know, most people will, you know, just try to coach to win their sport and, you know, do all those kind of things. And winning obviously is a good thing, but it was never number one for me. It was always working with the boys and helping them to grow up to be good men. And a big part of that was helping them to have good relationships with their dads. And so, you know, I was in a private school in uh, Louisiana that played in a public school league. And we did football camps every year for a week without a football. And actually did some uh, sessions then that we do at Capstone that were very therapeutic for the guys. And then also did father-son camps with them and their dads. And uh, that kind of took me into a whole nother level of what I really wanted to do. And that was not just work with the kid, but work with families. Uh, so I had a master's in education when I first got out of college and I went back to school and got a master's in substance abuse counseling while I was coaching because it was such a prominent issue with the kids that I worked with. And then uh, had a job offer to be the offensive coordinator at Abilene Christian University and that was, that was pretty appealing, but I actually thought I had the best coaching job in the world. Uh, but I knew that God was leading me to do something different, a little bit more intense, so I resigned and uh, went to Virginia Tech and got a PhD in marriage and family therapy. Uh, I started uh, working at uh, Harding University in 1993. Uh, another one of the professors and I wrote the curriculum for a graduate program in marriage and family therapy that had a heavy, heavy emphasis on dealing with trauma and addiction and those kind of things, and that was kind of my, my specialty. So I've taught there for 20 years as a full-time professor and uh, two and a half as a part-time as an adjunct. And during that time, we bought this property. Now it's called Capstone Treatment Center. And uh, one of the guys that was my friends from college that we coached together, we built a rubs course and uh, started a company and called it Capstone Adventures. And we basically did about 800 user days over seven years uh, doing father-son camps, father-daughter camps, sometimes a family camp. Worked with some churches, uh, some teams, youth groups, that kind of deal. Uh, but it was always trying to work towards starting the treatment center. And, and in 2001, actually the end of 2000, just happened to get some guys together that uh, actually I played college football with, with two of them. And uh, they had some money. Uh, stability and uh, we were able to get a loan and get this thing started in, in 2001. And so uh, the model that we use here is the model that I developed in my private practice during you know the 90s here. And so all the canine therapy and all the different things that you know we're known for that, that got started technically back there in 93. So uh, you know my uh, family is always first to me. I've been married to the love of my life since uh, I've actually been in love with her since we were 11. We've been married uh, for uh, 42 years next month. Wow. And our children, we have two girls that are 7 and 35 and twin boys that are 27 and then four grandsons. So always spending lots and lots of time with them and, and uh, you know, outdoors, you know, kind of deal. It's, it's kind of like that's what we do at Capstone, you know. We kind of try to continue the thing. And, and I've always known and believed that... Uh, the key to kids overcoming challenges and um, growing up and healing and getting on the right track and et cetera is relationship with their parents and with other adults. And uh, so we have a very, very strong family therapy program here. And, you know, our guys are, you know, the age range goes from 13 up to 26. And uh, when you put all them together in a pool, they're all about 15 or 16 years old when it comes down to it. So. Right. It's very different prefrontal cortex than in the 60s and early 70s, very different family situations. And so, you know, we just uh, kind of went about building this thing, uh, kind of like we built the football program down in Louisiana. You know, you just come up with the things that work the best, and, and uh, your goal is a lot bigger than just what people see, and it's not just about wins and losses. 
you know, it's about changing direction with people's lives, and uh, that's that's kind of a quick quick shot of it. If there's specific questions in that, just go ahead and ask them. Yeah. So um, I, I kind of sent you before the call some of the questions I'm going to ask. So I'm going to go down the list, and if some of it we've already covered it already, we can indicate that. But other than that, okay. you know, uh, first question on my list, uh, and first of all, I appreciate uh, the backstory. So that gives us a good idea, kind of where you're coming from, and, and Capstone. Um, mm -hmm. The next question is, how did you come up with the idea of pairing an adolescent with a puppy to begin with? Well, if, you know, we're not just adolescent, we're adolescent and young adult. Our average age of our kids is probably 19, but uh, they, you know, we have two cabins, you know, the 17 and unders and the 18 and olders. Um, so it's young adult and adolescent. But I, uh, first answer to that question is the, the picture on my desk right here, my dog Fred that I had for 12 years growing up. I always had a dog and, it, and would usually have it for more than a decade and you know knew what it meant to have that canine companion but in the 90s in my private practice you know I've got over 25,000 hours of therapy experience I would work with a lot of women uh, mostly women that had been sexually abused and if I had a woman client that had been sexually abused and did not have a very good support system that they were kind of taking it on alone if it had been a seductive abuse, uh, I would work with them to try to get them to get a Labrador Retriever or a Golden Retriever. And if it had been a forcible abuse, to get a German Shepherd. And I uh, just saw magical things happen with many different clients during those 90s because, you know, that, that trust, loyal companion for those that had been seductively deceived and betrayed just seemed to really help anchor them during the therapy process. And for those that had been overpowered through a uh, forcible abuse, uh, having that German Shepherd who's always kind of on red alert, uh, sleeping on the on the uh, pet cot by their bed, just help them to sleep. And I mean, I've seen many people's nightmares and flashbacks go away just by having that dog. So I knew if God ever opened up the doors to have a treatment center, uh, that we were going to definitely do canine companion therapy. So, you know, we just made the name up uh, instead of having our own official. Uh, therapy dogs here, each boy's got their, their puppy and then they take it home with them and that's why we call it canine companion therapy. Yeah, okay. And, and how do you screen the parents and adolescents to decide if they're a good fit for your program? Well, I think that's kind of done automatically when they, you know, when they look at our website and what we do because it is so different than your just, you know, general treatment center. You know, this treatment center, part of what's motivated me to start it is that I had many clients that you know in the 90s that were Christian families that really were inhibited and, and uh, cautious about sending their children to treatment when it would be a non-Christian group and it's somewhat similar on the opposite side of the coin that if you have somebody that's you know not a believer and uh, you know has a worldview that's very different than Christianity they're not going to be looking to come to a Christian treatment center well, there just wasn't very many out there that were Christian oriented that also had the professional excellence level in the treatment process. And so that's really who we get, you know, as people start doing the Google search and, and honestly about 90% of our admissions come from word of mouth referral from prior families and prior professional uh, referrals. But uh, most of that is done, you know, by them looking in, and seeing what we do. We've, we've never really had anybody that mom and dad were not going to be involved, you know, because that's kind of what we promote when we sell our program. The dog, you know, is a part of it. We've only had about five or six clients out of 1,200 that couldn't take their dog home, and that would be usually because they lived in a townhouse somewhere in a big city or didn't have the ability to bring it home. Right. Uh, you know, and then the other part of it is just, does a kid need to be in a, a residential program to be able to turn the direction of his life around? I mean, if they've drink a few beers and that's all they've done, they don't need treatment. So we always, you know, when they fill out assessments and, and send it in and talk to our admissions guys, we, you know, we want people to come here that really don't have any other chance of, of solving the problem without taking their son out of the loop and putting them in here for 90 days or more. Right, right. Um, okay, so next, can you walk me through the process? I'm going to ask you a couple different questions. I'll kind of uh, interrupt and then if you can kind of just expand on that. So you know, what, kind of, mm -hmm. what brings a dog to you? Do you pair each adolescent with a dog? Um, do you coordinate with that the parents in advance? Uh, does a, a kid or a young person have the opportunity to choose a dog from several, or do that you pre-select them? 
Um, we we select the breed. Okay. Uh, we we use Labrador retrievers, and uh -huh. uh, the reason we do is that there's three retrievers, and retrievers are just great companion dogs. You know, you've got the Chesapeake Bay Retriever on the top end. I mean, they're so tough, you almost have to use a sledgehammer to train them. You can't break their spirit, they're so tough, but they're really difficult to, to train. On the bottom end, you've got, uh, or the other end, I should say, the Golden Retriever, which actually makes a better therapy dog, you know, from the angle of it's very calm and very loving and those kind of things, but it's really, really sensitive and you can break its spirit with training mistakes. And so you take the lab and the lab, it's very durable physically, but it also has a durability when it comes to training, and, and uh, you, it's going to be really hard to mess a dog up, you know, as far as breaking its spirit. So the lab just seems to be the best overall dog for it. We do have times when a kid has got severe allergies and asthma that, that will get a golden doodle or a labradoodle for them, but that we still stay in that, you know, Labrador, you know, kind of breed. Right. The boys get to pick their uh, gender, male or female, and then the color, chocolate, yellow, or black. And 90% of the time, we have the puppy waiting on them when they get here for admission. That's always helpful in the admission process. Beautiful. And how, how do you teach the adolescents to care for the puppy? Is the treatment integrated with the caring of the puppy, or is part focus on treatment and part focus on puppy care? No, it's, it's all wadded up together. I mean, okay. it's, it's like you know, they start up in the morning, the first thing they do is they wake up at 6.30 and they have to be out of the door of the cabin by 7 to go take care of their puppy. That means you know, take them out of the kennel, and our kennels are unbelievable. I mean, there we just finished building this new set of kennels, and it's it's uh, uh, going to it's just the most first-class kennel I've seen anywhere anywhere. And they uh, scrub the kennel out with a, a solution to clean it and disinfect it. They give fresh water and, and food to the puppy. And then they do that again in the afternoon, uh, right before weight workout at five o'clock. But then in the middle of the day, they have an hour, which is their official canine therapy time. That's when they go to an isolated place on our property. We've got these little benches all over the place. They're about 50 yards away from each other because we don't want a boy to be with other boys or with other boys' dogs. We want him to be bonding with his puppy. Right. And so uh, that they do that an hour of the day. So they get about two hours a day with a puppy. but. If a kid's going through some trauma work and uh, maybe he's done a tough EMDR session, you know, we'll always, you know, therapists will get the boy out and walk down and get the puppy once in a while. If it's a disclosure session, uh, you know, during, the, you know, the part of it that's working on trauma that uh, the boy will have the puppy with him in the session. And so we use it just as it's called for all during the day at different times. Uh, but they can't sleep with them. You know, it's like we've had parents before that wanted their sons to sleep with them, but they can do that when they get home. Right. But here, we just got too many kids that would have allergies to that kind of deal. So that's how we, did, we you know, do it. Of course, on Sunday afternoon, there's a lot of free time because it's parent visitation. And so you'll see boys down at the pond, you know, either catching bass and fishing or they'll be, you know, throwing the bumper out for their dog to retrieve if it's one of the older dogs. We don't let the younger ones do that. But the, the older ones that, you know, once they get here, they get here at about six weeks is a really young dog for us to get. Ten weeks is probably a little bit older than normal. But once they get down the road and, and they are, you know, four months old, then we let them go to the pond and, and let them ease their way into swimming. And, and some of them retrieve. I mean, it's kind of really freaky if you know anything about dogs. We had one little chocolate here one time. His name was Nestle. He would go four feet underwater to retrieve a golf ball on the bottom, and I'd never seen a dog that young do anything like that. So, <laughs> that, that, that's a you know, beautiful dog doing what they, I guess, naturally do, right? Yeah, yeah, they love to please their boy, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, now next is how many adolescent children are in the program at the same time, and how many do you treat during an uh, average year? Well, remember, it's adolescent and young adults, uh -huh. and uh, it's about, about half and half as far as the numbers. We treat a total of about 120 kids a year. That's a, I think our admissions last year was 120. And how many, no, uh, how many beds or how many people at the same time? Well, we've averaged 28 point something census for about three years in a row, but we can go up, you know, to 32 or 33. We just, you know, our, our maximum average as we've got the formula set with the number of therapists, et cetera, is 32. Right. Um, you know, because we don't let therapists see more than two or three boys 
you know, we don't we don't let them see more than that because we want them to be fresh when it's time for family week and time to you know do their sessions. Yeah, yeah. And then how does, how does the average treatment stay last, and do you provide outpatient services? Yeah, it lasts 90 to 96 days. That's everybody. And uh, the only time we keep somebody longer is that you know we've had some guys ask to stay longer because they were in the middle of some trauma work. We've had some guys that. We recommend it therape- therapeutically. They stay longer, and that's going to always be because of trauma work. But then we've had, you know, maybe one in 20 or 30 that, you know, gets a week delay for some kind of misbehavior that they won't turn around during this, you know, during it. But probably 9.5 out of 10 or more actually will do that 90 to 96 days. Yeah. And uh, what was your other question? On that? After, do you do outpatient services? Yeah. We uh, actually have outpatient services with our therapist uh, after five o'clock. Okay. Uh, that will see people from the community, but then our aftercare is that you know when somebody admits, the therapist is on the phone with the parents every week for an hour, and then when they graduate, our therapist will have an hour phone call with parents and boy, um, once a week for twelve weeks. Uh, post-graduation and then on the fourth month that they are out they come back here for a two-day which we what we call a tune-up because that second six months of sobriety is when you get the highest rate of of relapse and so as they begin that second six months we do that little booster shot and then every August we have a weekend called family reunion that we invite everybody to come back to so that's the nature of our aftercare but the other side of that is we want them to be in aftercare where they, uh, wherever they are going. So if they're going back home. You know, we want that all set up and, and, and begun before a kid even graduates from here. But we still do our 12 weeks, no matter you know, even if they're seeing another therapist. Right. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and then, do adolescents and young adults do they go through the program together as a class on the same schedule, or do they just come in when bed space opens up for individualized treatment? Yeah, they, we admit 365 days out of the year, and the way we form clusters, that's the group that goes through the key modules together, is that we, we everything here happens on a four-week cycle. And so you have weeks one, two, three, and four in a particular cycle, and all the boys that admit during those four weeks will begin that fifth week as a unit where they do their you know trauma week and their vulnerability um, um, core concepts, family week, relapse prevention, they go through all those modules together. So they're staggered coming in in the admission over that four weeks, and then they, re- they reverse that stagger on the other end as they graduate out. So they all get that 90 to 96 days. And so, you know, it just, it, it's the luck of the draw on who all's in that. And it's just so far, it's all, you know, every cluster that I can remember has been a pretty good mix of the ages and where they come from in the country and those kind of things. Beautiful. Um, and then how do you, when they're in for 90 days, how do you account for or deal with students missing school while they're in treatment? Well, we have an education coordinator and he's connected with a, a local school here and it's really uh, a varied uh, approach to it. Like one kid will come in from a school and the school is very willing to send their homework every week and let the kids work on whatever that is and then we send it back. Others will shift to doing something online, and others will do something through the county school that's just about four miles from here. So we, if a kid is going to put effort into his school, you know, they won't get behind here. Of course, you know, you can bring the horse to water and and can't make them drink it, but uh, most kids come through here and they don't fall behind. They're not going to catch up on anything, you know, if they're already behind, but, but we continue the school, you know, here in those different ways. Okay, beautiful. Um, next, what are some of the challenges you see in dealing with adolescent addicts in general, and then how about specifically within your program? Well, you know, we wouldn't call the adolescents addicts because, you know, it's anybody that works with, you know, kids that are young adults and adolescents will tell you, we can't accurately determine if they truly have an addiction. If you define addiction as once you've got it, you've got it for life, uh, because I remember five different programs that were on a panel at NATAP several years ago, and that question was asked, can we as an industry tell an adolescent or a young adult that they're an addict? And all five programs answered no, because we all see them using so many drugs that if it was a 40-year-old, they'd die of an overdose 
but that young person's neuroplasticity allows them to just be able to take it and then we've seen them do it for two or three years heal trauma get out of college whatever it is that changes in their lives and then they drink a couple beers at the barbecue or a glass of wine at night and they never overuse and so that must have meant that wasn't an addiction and so when we look at them you know we, we look at kids as having core issue problems underneath and it manifests itself some of them in drugs and alcohol some in video gaming some in pornography, high-risk sex. I mean, there's so many different outside manifestations of the struggle that's going on inside. So we don't we don't have the labeling system here, I guess you might say. And uh, what I see is the biggest problem. I think that's the heart of your question. Is that it's kind of like a it's kind of like making a cake. You know, you make a cake. You've got all these different things you got to do right. You got to have the right kind of pan to put it in, the right ingredients. You know, you got to get it mixed up, you know, the right kind of way. You got to put it in an oven that's got the right temperature and leave it the right amount of time. And it's like the the systemic funnel, as we call it, uh, which is kind of like a, you know, the funnel you pour oil in your car with. Most of them are kind of red plastic. But imagine a funnel that is made out of jigsaw puzzle pieces. And we look at these kids that are born today and the world that they're born into. There's so many different puzzle pieces of the culture and of family and of different things that kind of work in a choreography that, you know, don't take away their personal responsibility at all, but they funnel them down in a certain direction that I think has created a perfect storm uh, for children developing addictions and, and uh, you know, having a lot of struggles, you know, in life. So which one of those things is most important? It depends on the kid, you know, unilaterally or universally, I should say. This, this group of kids has the weakest inner strength of any group that I've seen. And if you kind of go back and you can read some Malcolm Gladwell in his book, David and Goliath, and Dr. Angela Duckworth in her book, Grit, uh, talking about having the passion and perseverance to overcome obstacles and challenges over a long period of time. This generation that we're looking at now, the millennials down, they don't have as much of that inner muscle. And so that's a part of it. I mean, that's, that's really kind of the first thing that we work on trying to develop. But then you also have the most traumatized generation in history. When you go from all the stats on sexual abuse and you've got the, you know, 9-11 started when a lot of our guys were children and you, you've got all the different things that have changed from a trauma perspective. And Judy Crane does a great job of, you know, lining that kind of stuff out when she presents and I'm sure her new book will have it in there. So. The family is, is perhaps the biggest cornerstone of that, uh, that you look at the breakdown in family that, you know, 1910, there was a 5% divorce rate, and 1960, it was 10%, and now it's considered way over 50%, and kids don't have the access to family and to adults anymore. It's kind of like that bull elephant study, you know, in Africa, that the Lord of the Flies is more of what you see today because of a disconnect with adults instead of having some leadership and some relationship that come from that. So, you know, your question, I don't know that I can pick out one thing that is going to be the biggest deal because it's it's a, it's a, like different cakes or different flavors. Right. You know, this boy comes in today and he's got one thing that's the biggest part of his, but you, but you got to hit them all, you know. It's not like that you can just deal with one thing. It's kind of like sobriety, you know. Sobriety is not really all it's cracked up to be from one angle. Make sure you hear what I'm saying, not what I'm not saying on that is that if all we achieve is sobriety and we don't help fix the context that the boy lives in or the hurt that the boy's dealing with inside, it's going to be a whack-a-mole game. You know, they stop using this drug and they'll start doing something else that nobody knows they're doing. Stop doing that one, but you're not healing the core. It's just going to keep popping up in different forms. Right. Really try and get down to the root of the problem and fix that and then you can worry about everything else. Yeah, that's, we, we say we want to retrace the vine to the roots to the third generation and beyond, and that's kind of where we find all the answers to that question, what makes this kid make sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, do you have children who do well in programming towards sobriety, but for some reason just don't bond with a puppy? And if that's the case, what do you do then? Well, uh, you know, we probably have had, I'd say, less than a dozen boys out of 1,200 that didn't bond well with their puppy. And honestly, it's probably less than that. Uh -huh. um, we, had, we had one boy here one time who had, and, and I know you can't put the graphicness in this, and he witnessed his best friend's suicide, and 
and uh, it was very graphic and gross. And when he got here, he didn't even want to touch his puppy, have anything to do with it. So what our therapist did is just every day when it was time to do his one-on-one, and they get four hours a week of, of individual therapy, uh, he just went and got the puppy. And instead of trying to say, hey, why don't you pet this puppy? Isn't this puppy cute? The therapist just never mentioned the puppy and just held it and petted it himself. And then family we got here, which was about seven weeks into the program, and through the course of family week and what that therapist was doing, the boy started touching it, then he started holding it, and by the time he left here, he wouldn't, you couldn't pull it out of his hands. So most of the time, if we have a kid that's going to be, uh, kind of have a wall up about his puppy, you know, it, it, it doesn't stay that way because we're going to work it. We're not going to try to stuff it down his throat. Yeah. Um, the ones that have had trouble, and again, that's going to be less than a dozen, were the ones that had really, really bad, you know, attachment stuff, and they couldn't bond, and, you know, maybe they had a tough situation at home, you know, and it's very rare, because honestly, when you get these guys that come in, most of our kids are kind of like can can cut guys, but you get some kid that comes in, and he's trying to be Billy Bad Bud, and then you give him that puppy, and then you look out the window and see him wherever he is by himself, and he all of a sudden is eight years old again. You know, it's like it's pretty remarkable to see how it kind of melts away any of those, you know, armor and mask and those kind of things. So it doesn't happen much, I guess I should have said to begin with and save you all these words. <laughs> well, I, I can imagine that. Um, okay, so the next question, what are some of the early stage learning experiences you've had with this kind of therapy, and then how did you adapt to solve those learning experiences? So I guess over the years. Well a good question. Um, one learning experience is to see how kids are changing over six years. You know, it's like it's it's like they're becoming more and more overindulged, more and more entitled. Uh, there's more kids with attachment incapacities. You know, when you think about attachment problems, it's a, an absence of neural pathways in the brain that, that allow you to bond with someone else. And, and classically, that's just kids that were, you know, born in Romania and, you know, lived on the streets and all this kind of stuff. But we see kids coming out of intact families when there's, you know, parents that are working all the time or, you know, having different struggles themselves that come here and, and they don't really know how to attach. Um, so I guess one of the things that, that I would say is, is to keep reading our keys instead of just come up with what we're going to do and then make it a canned plan. You know, we want to respond to what's happening with the kid as they grow through. So there's more and more and more guys that are, you know, social media freaks, you know, and the research I think says it that the average eight to eighteen year old will look at fifty three to seventy hours of screen time per week. Yeah. And a lot of other studies talk about that about half the kids in America will measure their self worth by what they get in response to their you know, social media posts and all that kind of stuff. And I don't do any of it, but I'm just saying that, you know, they look at who's giving them likes and who's saying all that stuff. So they've kind of moved into this era in our culture where they're, they're being, you know, fed a line that this is how you have intimacy is by doing it on social media, but they kind of always walk away empty because they don't really have it, you know, and it's like wondering why in the heck did that not work? So it's, it's, that's a change from 2001 through 2009, you know what I'm saying? It's like that, that decade, we didn't deal with it near as much as we're dealing with it here. So I guess learning to see that kids are changing faster with the culture than they used to be. As far as any inherent, you know, problems, you know, I mean, I, I guess I don't really have a lot of those if I, I can't even remember or think of any of them. I mean, I coached you know, hard-headed boys with big hearts for 14 years. And so I think that down inside, they're the same. It's just that the thing they're having a battle on the outside is very different. You know, the pornography thing has changed dramatically. It's probably the, the, the worst thing that we deal with and the most commonality with guys. And when, when a male sees moving porn, he's got an 1,100% dopamine potentiation, which is equal to crystal meth and crack cocaine. So, you know, that average age of male first exposure to porn you know, has gotten younger and younger and younger over the last two decades, and that's because of the internet. That's that's changing it really fast. Yeah, the, the easy access uh, is just unbelievable. Yeah, 
Um, okay, so next, where, where do the uh, patients come from? Are they uh, all over the country, all over the world? Where do, uh, I guess yeah. most of your patients come they, from. Yeah, they've come from uh, 44 states so far, and I think six places outside the U.S. Uh, you know, we've got some heavy spots. I think Arkansas is still our number one, um, you know, ranked state. Uh, Texas, you know, Alabama. But, I mean, we have had kids here in a family week where one's from Alaska, one's from Florida, one's from New York, and one's from California. It's kind of funny to yeah. think sometimes how different, you know, that it is. But then again, you know, there's a commonality in that they're just kids. And from our perspective, they're all made in the image of God, so they've got the same thing inside. Most of their parents come here, and, and the Christian part of it is a part of why they choose it, although we've had parents before that were, you know, full-blown atheist and uh, came here. One of the, the fun, best emails that I've ever gotten from a mom was an, a mom who was an atheist, and uh, uh, she just loved and appreciated our program. Now, we didn't stop talking about God when we did, and we're not an evangelistic program, but the principles that we work off of, you know, are going to have a heavy emphasis, you know, in Scripture. Right. So I think that kind of, most of our parents can come here and have a commonality because they most of them are believers and that kind of helps out with that but bottom line is you know people are people and families you know, when their kids hurting they're the most motivated they'll ever be in their life to do whatever it takes to help save their kid so very true we take that and go with it all right and i think i know the answer on this one but the next question is are, are more of your patients male or female why do you think that is well all of our in residential guys are males and if we do females you know we'll buy a place that's you know, 10 miles away with a electric <laughs> fence around it. Yeah. But uh, we did not want to deal with the time and energy that it would take every single day to deal with the boy-girl, you know, issues. Yeah. And uh, so 77% of the kids that went to treatment and, you know, somewhere around 2,000 were males. And males were what my, you know, what I wanted to do, you know, anyway. Right. So... Uh, we do work a lot with parents. You know, our parents come here during the family week and during the the uh, family retreat at the end, and and we, you know, they do their own work as well. I mean, we've had a lot of parents that began their trauma work or their marital work or, you know, whatever it is. We we don't just have them come in and learn about their son's problem. But we want to, we want them to look at the solution. That actually, comes more from mom and dad than it does from anybody else, and that's part of what the research says. And and our model is based on this that. The number one indicator of the outcome for a young adult or adolescent in treatment is the degree of participation by the parents. Yeah, the family. So the more, yep. Yeah, if, if mom and dad are working on it, then you know you got a really good shot at the title. Agreed. Um, next one. Do you find that parents are strongly persuading the adolescents to take the program, or do most come on their own? So, is it the parents finding your program, or is it the kids finding it and saying, "There, that's where I want to go." And I understand young adults, so I guess the patients, is it parents pushing the patients or the patients finding you on their own? No, it's just 99.99% parents finding it. I mean, you don't find any young adult or adolescent in their right mind that wants to go to treatment. You know, it's like you might have some of the older ones that have hit so many different things that have bloody their nose that they're asking for help, but uh, not many of them, you know, it's like... I kid people sometimes at some of the conferences that, and I'll say that we don't do the 12 steps here, we just do number one through four over and over again, because about the time a kid gets to the point of taking a personal inventory, he kind of rechecks himself on saying he was powerless the day before. So that the nature of our kid, the level of, of prefrontal cortex not being developed, the level of high testosterone levels and resiliency, it's like... You know, they don't ask for help, they don't hit bottom, they don't want help, you know, it's like you gotta create the deal that they don't want to refuse, you know, that godfather line, that deal they can't refuse and get them here. But that's a part of the whole deal is mom and dad are the guardrails on this trip of growing up. And so that's you know, I don't think you find any adolescents and young adults when I say any, ninety percent of them are not gonna to want to go to treatment and interrupt their lives. So thirteen is the youngest and twenty six is the oldest. Well, puppies included in the cost of being here. Uh, the uh, We're out of network on the insurance deal, and the cost for the 90 to 96 days is 62000 What they do is that you do a pre-cert, and uh, 
insurance companies have a certain amount that they will pay or they won't pay. And uh, we have a, a person that works here that's kind of that bulldog that knows how to work on the insurance companies. And, you know, they get quite a few of our families get, you know, really good in reimbursement. We've had a few in the last few years that have got 100% of it paid. Uh, most don't, but they, you know, can get a substantial amount. At one time, I think it was, well, I'm not going to give you a number because I'm not sure what it would be today, but. Yeah, they get some reimbursement if they've got that, but who's responsible for it? The parents that send them, and, and you know, we've collected 98% of what we build over the last 16 years. So we've got some kids that are as sober and clean as they can be that are not doing as well as some that have had some event relapses, you know, because I think the measuring stick that most people look at are sobriety or the lack thereof or recidivism, have they gone back? And the vast majority of our guys you know, thus far have not gone back to treatment. Well, that's nice and good, but, you know, our, our deal is it's a whole lot bigger picture than that. And uh, that's why I will ask the question, you know, so what if we only achieve sobriety? You know, well, we don't, we don't think we've really gone, you know, very far, you know, with that, because it's about that whack-a-mole game. So we don't go around trying to publish, you know, success rates, because I don't think you could actually measure our success, you know, on a data kind of deal, because it's like, what's the relationship with their parents like? What's the relationship with their siblings like? You know, where are they and, and uh, you know, working toward their goals and dreams in life, you know, and all those things. And, and it, I don't think you can put that in a small box of, you know, have they had a relapse or not? Or have they gone back to treatment or not? The vast majority of them, you know, do not repeat a treatment experience. When they leave, they have what we call the two-year finish strong game plan. And it's a, a game plan for everybody. Mom has one, dad has one, you know, the family does, the boy does. Of course, the boy is responsible for his game plan, but the parents are responsible for their response to how well the boy does on his. And so, you know, the guardrails are there on the road because most of our guys are kind of like a jet ski on full throttle with no <laughs> handlebars. So we want mom and dad to be the guardrails to keep them from spinning out. So how, how, Specific that is, uh, or non-specific depends on the boy's age and you know where he's going from here. Um, but it's a it's a very detailed plan that's got choices with consequences and rewards over a period of time. Uh, there are five correlatives with success when a guy gets out of here. The boys that continue to wake up early in the morning that's the number one indicator that a kid's going to be doing well. Those that get up in the morning where they can be at school or work by 8 o'clock do really well. The second one is that they continue their workout because we work out in the state-of-the-art facility five days a week. The third is the boys that continue to uh, train their dog, care for their dog, have that relationship with their dog, etc. And the fourth one is the time that they come in at night, you know, that they get home. And then fifth is their sleep hygiene. Guys that are getting the good sleep, you know, they're not in there staying up all night on video games and et cetera, but they're getting their REM sleep. Those five things are the five top correlates with success when a kid leaves here. The ones that are doing those are the ones that are doing the best. They have to graduate to, have to get the puppy. You know, if somebody decides that they want to leave early or whatever, they, they don't get the puppy unless they graduate. Um, you know, we had one kid that I remember that we removed him from having his puppy because he was being too rough with it, uh, but that, that doesn't happen very often. Matter of fact, that's the only kid I can remember we've ever taken the puppy away from him. Uh, the biggest thing is you graduate, you get your puppy, and when it comes to the parents, that's a part of their game plan is that they do not take care of the puppy, that the boy takes care of the puppy. And so, again, you know, what the parents do in that situation is, is very, very important. But, you know, one of the things that we've found is that families will rally around the dog. I had a dad call me one time, and uh, I got to know this dad pretty well, and he called and he said, Ryan, I'm so mad at Ryan. And I said, why? He said, he's going to college. I said, well, that's great. He said, no, he's taking Sweetie with him. And I said, well, Sweetie's his dog. You've got to let him go. And so that family had just gotten so close with that dog. He was, you know, tongue-in-cheeking me a little bit. It's kind of like everybody was close to it. And so what happens when you, you know, have a family that rallies around the dog and builds that relationship is that they actually build a relationship with each other better. So that's, that's one of those things I really never thought about, you know, as we were doing this, but it has, has come to be pretty common.
you know, you need to have a good kennel that can keep the puppy healthy. Um, you know, a lot of people, the dog will stay inside, and so then they've got a, you know, place that they can go walk the dog and, you know, those kind of things. Of course, you can teach these dogs, you know, to do anything. Um, but then, you know, you've got morning and evening care, and then you've got when in the day do you play, because play is what's so important, uh, you know, with them. And, of course, some of our guys will train their dogs uh, to be duck hunting dogs and retrieve and others just to be companions and you know go to the dog park and it just kind of depends on what that kid enjoys himself but the, the total care of the dog is the responsibility of the boy and they get a packet when they leave about their shots and you know heartworms and all the different things that they need to do and, and they have a card that is the uh, you know the little card you get at the veterinarian's office on registering your dog and getting the uh, um, oh, what's it called? You know, when they send you a, a card that says, hey, he's due for his rabies shot, um, all those things are in their packet that they know when they leave. The, uh, the thing that everybody leaves with, this game plan, the therapist talking to the parents and to the boy once a week for 12 weeks, the biggest part of that is troubleshooting and encouraging and motivating, are you sticking with the game plan? Because it's kind of one of those things that... Uh, you know, if a kid gets out of here and just does really, really, really good when he leaves, a lot of times parents will lower their guard, and that's the worst thing they'll, that you can do. But it's like you you maintain your drug screen protocol and, and follow that game plan. So that therapist talking to them every week is to help facilitate that. Then when they come back here uh, four months after graduation, uh, you know, they'll, we actually ran a camp, you know, off campus, and and do that work but then they'll come you know for their visit to uh, capstone and it's always this you know one fun time to see these kids after three months and how they're doing and see their parents and you know because parents are involved in that tune-up as well um, that's a pretty intense deal because then if you get there and things are not going well with somebody then that's when our therapy team will get with them and say okay look are you following the game plan well it's, it's not going well it's because they're not following the game plan and so we kind of keep that up and then that's when we kind of sign off of the process until August when they come back for family reunion. But in the middle of all that, you know, we get calls from parents all the time about, you know, what's going on or an email from a kid and, you know, those kind of deals. So the biggest deal with that is that we want to make sure we get a good, seamless continuum of care of them being in the therapy that they need to be in back home with somebody that's you know, educated and trained in doing this kind of work. We get parents' trauma on the table because when you go backwards and look at it, it's like there, there's a lot, you know, our parents don't cause their kids to be involved in the stuff that get them to capstone. In most cases, they don't cause it. But the, the ways that they have survived over the decades and generations sometimes create patterns in their family's language of relationship that make it hard to, to be the solution to the problem. So we always tell parents that they may or may not be a part of what caused the problem, but they're definitely the biggest solution to solving it. So whatever therapy work that needs to happen for them to be that solution stronger, that's the work that they've got to be in. You know, it's, uh, I mean, we have one, one guy that uh, graduated from here in 2002 that now has his PhD and works at an aftercare program for capstone guys. You know, he does therapy with our graduates. He's now married with three children. You know, we had, you know, one guy that uh, came here in 2001. I think he graduated in January of 02. And uh, he was a local kid. And, you know, it's kind of funny because I got to do his wedding about six years after he graduated. And now he is married and has two little girls and they actually lived in the neighborhood with my family until about a year ago and then we moved out here close to Capstone. But, you know, they'd be walking around the neighborhood pushing the babies in the, in the strollers and they'd just pop in the house and visit. You know, it's kind of cool to see him become an adult man, making a living, being a good dad and husband, that kind of deal. I mean, you know, I can tell you a hundred of those stories. You know, our signature is, is the trauma work and the tough family stuff. You know, we do it in a way that uh, I think fits uh, a, a male child that's in that 13 to 26 age range.